So these are very um, so they're very realistic. Sort of not. Uh, you might have seen these Mitchell and Kenyon films that were found in a milk churn on the telly. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Toolman narrating here. Real scenes from the Transvaal. These fake war war films yeah. are popular with the home audience. He's very sleepy because it's very difficult. And I like that, don't you? You could have. He's going to sleep on his on his gun, isn't he? Oh no! Made these films. They were actually. He was just having a nice nap. That British soldier, wasn't he? In, in the, and then they came up and got him. They snuck around. In oh look! No, I'll just get you. The and commissioners in board oh, and so then in court he's very valiant get in for the bush so for that the, really did him didn't it that um, would have been a yeah. done a live performance by people actually hearing gunfire this was a common mm. trick and one local commentator complained that yeah nice um, nice work so you couldn't see the pictures on the screen <laughs> so um uh, I did my PhD on a couple of people who did um, production in early British cinema when they were doing these big, long films. And there was this big film made in 1913 called 16 Year, 60, not 16, 60 Years of Queen, obviously about Queen Victoria. And um, it's got a lot of war scenes in, even though... Um, and uh, so here we have Sebastopol or Sebastopol, Crimean War. And um, it was made in Ealing, in Ealing Cinema, because before there was Ealing Studios as we know it today, there was Barker Motion Photography. They set up, this guy Will Barker, he set up the first studios at Ealing in the same ground. So they had a lot of this. Um, multiple people action. These are from uh, some stills of it. So you've got the, all these soldiers dressed up in all these costumes that they got from the theatres in London. Um, in Walpole Park, I don't know if anybody knows Ealing. That's, they kind of bust out of Ealing Studios into the park to um, do all these incredible international stages of fighting. So there's... Um, General Gordon, the great martyr, self-made martyr of Victorian times, sort of at war, being, um, he refused to leave Khartoum and sort of made himself and the people of Khartoum um, at siege and, and made everybody have a martyrdom with himself. So this became a, a big thing in, in Victorian politics sort of split people between those who um, thought he was a sort of <laughs> doing a good thing and those who thought he was just an e evil, stupid person. Yeah, General Gordon. So what else have we got? We've got other fictional war films that's definitely based on books. Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott from 1913. And um, this is a, a book about Richard I. Everybody loves the War of the Roses, but still seem to love the War of the Roses. And, uh, um, and everybody loves these, the medieval spectacle of gallant knights sort of hammering it out on each other. And the big tournaments, isn't there, with the uh, beautiful queens that everybody fights over by riding about on horses, jousting. And in the Victorian times, they had these uh, big performances at the, they called them hippo dramas. I think hippo is horses. So basically dramas with horses at Astley's Amphitheatre. So Ivanhoe, that was filmed in, in Wales, uh, Chepstow Castle. And then you've got King Charles, 1913, a bit closer to home, because this is uh, from a book by um, W, I suppose that's William, that it's William, 
Harrison Ainsworth, and he wrote Ovingdon Grange, a tale of the South Downs, and he described how the future Charles II, he stayed there for 24 hours for a whole day before escaping to France in 1651. And he managed to father a child while he was there, this quick, quick, quick work, and he sheltered in the chimney breast of the master bedroom while he was being smuggled out. And it's a real manor house, you might know, east of Brighton, Ovingdean, and it's famous for being the former home of Steve Coogan. My mum used to teach with Steve Coogan's mum, okay? Just thought I'd get a bit of my own personal history in here, seeing as, uh, yeah, I've got personal history as well. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah, so Steve Coogan, whose mum talked with my mum at Bolton Tech, um, flogged um, that manor after his plans to build a swimming pool were rejected. Devastated, Steve Coogan sold his um, house for 3.25 million in 2018, having bought it for 2.45 million in 2011. So I also recommend property as a way of uh, making lots of money. If you, yeah, as an alternative to Bitcoin or, um, and also comedy, obviously. Very, very good, lucrative kind of thing to do. So, yeah, so there's, there's the War of the Roses. Oh my gosh, what a lot of wars that was. What a lot of warring stuff that happened then between people. And um, it was pretty horrible. Anyway, so Richard I, who's the most evil monarch? We've got that as well. It means Richard III. Richard III, who um, can't forget uh, the various Richard III's that we have seen played out on the big screen. And they found him recently, didn't they, in Leicester, Leicester Car Park. I, I used to work at Reuters, right? And the person I shared a desk with, got some personal life story too. Um, <laughs> My friend Fiona used to work on the same desk, but she was a member of the Richard III Society. And um, she, oh my God, when they found Richard III, I worked and I was never heard the end of Richard III. Right, but anyway, so this is sort of a war stuff you can have, isn't it? It's a bit later on, but it's very much based on the sort of theater that was part of British war film that came from the theater, like all oh, lots of Shakespeare, Kings, taking a long time to die. People call it silent, but there was lots of triumphalist music. Lots of haircuts. Maybe that could be in this year. And I mean, the mullet, the mullet must be going out soon. I, I don't recommend getting a mullet, anybody, even though having lived through the first mullet. The page boy, isn't it? The page boy here. Yep, so he doesn't got a horse, that's bad. And then he dies like it takes him ages. <laughs> so let's go to the film that is the main film I'm going to propose as, as a very important early war film. Jane Shaw. Jane Shaw, who was she? She, anybody know who Jane Shaw was? It was a War of the Roses. Uh, uh, yeah, she's a War of the Roses, that sort of heroine type person. She. Um, uh, some people say Shoreditch is called after Jane Shaw because she died in a ditch. <laughs> but that is apocryphal because I think Shoreditch actually was a ditch that they used to throw dead dogs and things like that in. I think. Yeah, so Jane Shaw, she was a lover of Edward IV and then when um, Richard the Second came in, so it's uh, Richard the Third. I can't. Uh, there's too many. I, I can't even do that poem. But they. Um, so she ends up on the wrong side of uh, of that particular bit of history. So uh, anyway, it's a chance to kind of be very sexy, isn't it? This is super sexy. Obviously, before um, the uh, censorship really kicks in. So she's little, got a nice nice hair as well, like really long. So I reckon that's. Really long hair, though. It's very important, the hair in these period dramas. So she had a bad time, so she had to do penance because she was um, 
you know, because um, she was a lover, because she was a mistress, and because she was um, a mistress of the wrong king. So uh, when she got on, yeah, when her champion was no longer on the throne, she had a, um, she was made to do penance. We're going to look a bit more at that in a second, and a bit more at her hair. But here we are. This is the kind of sort of fighting scene we can imagine was in, in the film. In fact, I think I took this, I think I sneakily took these off the Steenbeck um, machines at the BFI. That was quite nice because um, David Starkey was in the other room while I was doing this and he was making that film about, um, uh, was it at Queen Elizabeth? And it was her diamond jubilee and he kept saying the wrong number and I had to correct him. So that was a nice, <laughs> a nice moment um, of my own war, culture war there. But yeah, so they're all falling down the stairs. Oh no, it's really awful. So right, we've got the penance here. So it's all big scenes. This is 1913 filmed in Britain. So they are not CGI. They are real people in lots of helmets, lots and lots of helmets, and lots of fake snow. And there she is, Jane Shaw with lots of hair and she's having to walk through the streets to do penance barefoot. Um, Jane Shaw, her hair, and enter Jane Shaw, her hair hanging loose on her shoulders and barefooted. Alas, alas, her brain, I fear, is turned. In mercy, look upon her, gracious heaven, nor visit her for any wrong to me. Sure, I am near upon my journey's end. My head runs round. My eyes begin to fail and dancing shadows. Swim before my sight, I can no more, lies down. Receive me, thou cold earth, thou common parent. Take me to thy bosom and let me rest with thee. That's from the play that was really famous by Nicholas Rowe. Because um, she was really famous. There would have been a time in a kind of gathering like this in the UK, as it wasn't called then people would have known who Jane Shaw was, tragic heroine. Yeah, uh, tragic. And we still watch a lot of, call them, I don't know, call the midwife and stuff, isn't it? Um, a lot of miserable sort of women having terrible death sort of thing, or maybe that's not really call the midwife. There's a bit, because it kind of usually ends up happy. Um, yeah, so, yeah, she's having a bad time. She's lying down and dying. But she doesn't actually die. I think she, actually, in real life, she didn't die. It was just wishful thinking. <laughs> so look at this. This big castle. Look at that. Great big castle. I don't think they actually went down. I don't know. I mean, they did a lot of real stuff in those days, but I can't believe that anybody's going down that on that road in real. Oof. So they had a lot of um, hilltops, valleys, beach and sea. Like it's an opportunity for army manoeuvres, hand-to-hand co combat, all these angles. So where would they go to film around here? Well, because they were, they were in London, in Ealing, remember? So this is going to be a sort of area they might come to. So they did. They went to Lewis Prison and got out a load of convicts for the day and gave them some beer <laughs> and got them in some... Uh, uh, some costumes from the theatres in London. And they went to this place. Anybody know this? Yes. Devil's Dyke. The steepest, steepest dry valley in the world or something. Europe. Is it Europe? But it's, I couldn't work out how it actually works, really. And I did read the geology stuff about it. But it's something to do with chalk, isn't it? Freezing. And then it becomes slushy. Like, got a lot really slushy, and then it makes it very steep. So that happened a long time ago. <laughs> and um, it's really steep now, and it says you mustn't take young children there or go there if you have a heart condition, because it's too <laughs> steep for you. And um, so it was a, quite a steep place and a bit of a stupid location, really, to film a load of people who were drunk from Lewis Prison for the day with a load of... Um, costume that they've got out of the theatres in West London because they've got pikes, they've got halberds, I don't know what they are but they have them, look there they've got them <laughs> they've got them and they're wearing them 
And there they are, going along, loads of them, imagine, loads of them, sort of going over the downs. That's people, that's not CGI. People. <laughs> and here we are in the film, there they are, look at them. That is, that's steep, that is really steep. And they've got all that stuff on, you can see, look. And, and, um, and they've got, uh, whatever they are, they have all, lots of stuff, don't they? Really, some people are really good at this stuff. When I used to do a um, shot list, so that's to describe, you know, describe what's on the, on a lot of war footage when I was at Reuters. But some people really know everything, you know, what sort of helicopter is that? Oh, I'll just put that in and what, what army gear is that? So I'm just writing Chinook, that's about all I can do. Uh, it's the same thing here. I'm sure there's some people here who really know what all this gear is. <laughs> but yeah, let's hear from somebody who was there at the time. The hillsides at the Devil's Dyke were so steep that directly a section started to advance. They could not stop themselves going forward. There was some good hand-to-hand -hand fighting when these two sides clashed together at the bottom of the valley. The pike men, pike men, technical, the pike men holding long pikes and very large shields. I'm glad to see he doesn't have any. He's not much better than me got the signal flag to move into battle. Owing to the steepness of the hills, few pikemen got into difficulty right away until one thought of a brilliant brainwave, placing his shields down on the ground at the top of the hill, downing their shields, they sat on them and started to slide fast like a lot of canoes, shooting the rapids, reaching the bottom. And, and when they reached the bottom, they just went at it hell for leather. And I think you can see this is... This is some hell for leather <laughs> happening there. And um, because, you know, this film was pretty expensive in those days. So Barker, he was filming at the top with his camera. And um, he was, you couldn't really shout stop and start it again. It's like a one take kind of thing. You're not going to get them back up, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. So uh, good editing. So yeah, they, they, I think they probably cut out the best through the magic of editing, but even so, even so. So it was a really, what they call a super film. It doesn't mean it was any good. It means it had a lot of, um, it had a lot of stuff in it, basically. Look at that. Number of artists employed. 5,748 and so on. You can see 342 horses. That's a lot. Look, look at that number of battle arms used. Four and a half thousand. Timber used. Very important figure. 37,900 feet. Amount of velvet used. 870 yards. Silk used. 2,920. It means nothing to me, but I can see it's a lot. <laughs> Look, I've got some more slides of the, of the um, fighting. That's good. I wonder if... I've been trying to look at it to see if I can really see them sliding on it, and they do look a bit in disarray, that's all I can say. OK, so I just thought, you know, we need to see some women. It's a film about women. We need to have uh, some gender sort of balancing here. So you can see it was dangerous for women as well, because they had this costume that could get into trouble. Look at that, look at the wind, and um, their costume going there. And you can see it's sort of, you know, not very practical costume, quite difficult to wear. Now oh, we've got more of this. I can't, I can't, can't get enough. I can't, my great editing. <laughs> so, um, Barker, who filmed all this, it's amazing, isn't it? I think that's an amazing picture. Look at that. I mean, it, anyway. So, yeah, he, um, he developed a thing called the event camera team because he loved doing topicals. His favourite thing wasn't really fiction film. It was topical films. So he liked to... Um, he developed the event camera team, which is where you have multiple people taking uh, cameras at different locations at a particular event. And then he kind of applied that technology to the fiction film to do these big scenes. So anyway, after 1913, 
And guess what's going to happen next? That like real one, war, um, 1914. And um, it was shot, actually it wasn't shot in 1913, I've got it, I'm saying it all wrong, it's just before, it's actually in 1914, just before the war. So, um, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so, it, you know, the, you know, war, there, so it was, um, it was a big deal that, and it, for the cinema industry in um, Britain and kind of fucked anything over that they had planned, really. It's, um, they lose everything to Hollywood and everything, and unsurprisingly, it was probably the least casualty because um, British films are no good anyway. No, they are good. Some of them are good. Some of them are really good. In fact, I really like, um, it's really nice sometimes when you see stuff that's made um, with British, um, I don't know, if, well, my, my daughter was watching this, uh, she works in the cinema and she, she made this film recently, it's, it's coming out this year, but um, when they went to the preview, you know, things like the plastic chairs that you can have at school, it was like British plastic chairs. Now, I don't mean that in a patriotic way, but it's kind of, you know, nice to see the textures and the aesthetic of your... Uh, you know, that you recognise. It's kind of exciting sometimes because you don't, otherwise everything is like, kind of like American high school that you tend to see in uh, a lot of movies. And I, and I want various things. I want films from different places, including the UK. I want to see different atmospheres in the, in the big cinema stories. So war. We're coming to the end now. It's war. <laughs> And I have a piece of paper that has some people's res response to war, and I thought we should say because yeah, they couldn't um, put it in the cinema. It finally was um, out in in 19, six, uh, 15, yeah, 15. That's when they they released it. I don't know really if how it went down in 19. I do know a bit about how it went down. It was was kind of okay, but people had other things on their mind. Um, the 4th of August, 1914, was a Tuesday. Um, anyway, this follows a bank holiday weekend when lots of people went away. And 14-year-old Arthur Tevendale was in East Sussex at the time. And he says, I remember so well that the one and only hotel at Rottingdean, they had a waiter or somebody who was a German. And when the news came through by telephone to say that war had been declared against Germany, I can see him now rushing out to the road there wringing his hands and in his, I'm just going to read it as he put it, guttural English saying, it is madness, and he was really shocked. What a what scene, you know, I mean, how terrible for that guy, um, and for everybody, but, you know, but to draw that, paint that little scene of how it affects real people, is sort of mad declaring of war. Um, and then there's Frederick Holmes, who was 17 when he heard of the outbreak during a carefree holiday. I was on the river boating, the River Nime at Northampton. It was a favourite place for boating. And when we were there, we heard from the riverbank that war had broken out. Well, I was with two other fellows on the boat, and I think we were all excited, and we anticipated we may have a go. So, you know, that's being 17, isn't it? Um, I suppose, and you... And also, you get ex I mean, people are excited by war. That is a big problem, in a way, that it's sort of a bit human nature to be excited by danger. And um, Elizabeth Lee, who was 22, hardly gave the news of war a second thought. At the particular day when war was declared, I was on holiday, lots of people were on holiday. It came suddenly, I was away staying with friends. It was on the newspaper placards. Dad came home at night and he said, War has been declared on Germany. Um, people who followed politics, of course, expected it, but I don't think I bothered much about it. You don't when you're young and having a good time. Thank you. I've gone really over time. <laughs>